So, Ed, um, you know, we were talking earlier about the flying triangle and, you know, the sort of the technology. So did you ever sort of hear anything about that technology elsewhere, the, the, the gravity uh, warping technology or however you might describe it? Did you ever hear about any other stories about that? It was quite interesting because it came in pieces, and we've talked about uh, the five plus friends I had for 20, 30 years that uh, referred me to other friends. And uh, we were told that the GR3B might have stood for tactical reconnaissance, which never made sense because uh, tactical reconnaissance just doesn't seem to be a role for that type of vehicle. And then other people said it was Teledyne Ryan, the TR and TR3B was Teledyne Ryan, which I think is part of Northrop North Boeing. Uh, but um, I was led, to, introduced to uh, a gentleman that was, uh, his name was Larry, and he was about, well, he was going on 70 when I, I was about uh, in the early 90s when I started doing the research and interviewing people. And he told me about when he was a kid, uh, fists is right out of MIT. And he had worked up at, uh, I believe it was Gravity Rand, there at Cars near Carswell Air Force Base. And he told me this story that when he first went to work for Gravity Rand, that they were getting technology in there and trying to understand how it worked. Uh, and he said he was led to believe that it was foreign uh, technology. So he thought, well, okay, it's the Russians or the Japanese or Germans or somebody's top secret uh, scientific uh, developments. And they were literally basically back engineering, which most people call reverse engineering nowadays. Uh, and it came to the point to where the advances in technology, science and electronics, physics that they were finding out made no sense to him that it, 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 it had to be far better than anybody he could conceive of on Earth actually building some of these pieces of, of equipment or technology. So he worked for this older scientist that was in charge of him and he reported to he finally got so frustrated, he blew up to the scientists. He says, you know, this is all bullshit. He says, you know, this, the Japanese can't be making this, or the Russians, or the Chinese. He says, he says you know, this, I don't even know how this could be made on Earth. And the old scientist, uh, he told him, he said, you just answered your own question. <laughs> and after that, the, the old scientist apparently had been involved uh, with this from about 49 or 50, which uh, puts you kind of in the timeline of Corso, talk Colonel Corso and Eisenhower staff talking about revealing bits and pieces of recovered UFO material and seeding it out to universities and industry to try to develop it or understand it. Uh, so it fit perfectly with the story. The, uh, the he, uh, mm -hmm. he said at one point, they had developed this Taurus, uh, and he also said it had some, something to do with the mercury. Now, I had a lot of physicists tell me long, long, long stories, and I'm not a physicist. I, uh, I, the only physics I understand is basically the type you would use with electronics engineering. So when they talk about different propulsion systems or exotic materials or what we now call metamaterials, uh, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. I just picked up different terms, and that was, that was basically it. But he said the, they, they built this Taurus, and they, they figured this thing would uh, reverse gravity. So, so they had this massive Taurus that was about, I think, 10 feet tall and probably about 50 feet across. Uh, it looks like a, basically a huge inner tube or, or, or donut, and it's filled with some type of uh, gases or ions. And they had this thing chained down with these huge chains to the concrete because they didn't know if this thing was going to explode or go through the floor or go through the ceiling. 
uh, of this warehouse, and they turned it on with all this massive voltage and amperage, and uh, it didn't do anything. And we spent huge amounts of money, and then somebody had the, uh, uh, I guess just common sense, went up it, and uh, you could see the chains were topped. Uh, and then they measured the actual weight. They, they turned it off, they retested it, and they, they measured the weight of the Taurus with it turned on and found out that they had reduced gravity about 89-90%. So then uh, I asked him, I said, well, how would you go from a Taurus, which sounds like a maybe a a UFO propulsion device uh, to triangle. He says, well, if you can reduce weight, but you don't have 100% lift or 100% anti-gravity, he says, you, you put the Taurus in a massive vehicle that's triangular shape, and you use advanced propulsion systems on each corner of the triangle to give you the lift and, steer, and, uh, lift and steer it, but you're only lifting 10 or 11% of the mass and the weight. So which made perfect sense to me why they actually had to develop some type of gravity warping or uh, anti-gravity is actually a, a popular term, but it's it's not a, a real term scientists would use. But they, they had to develop some type of gravity lift or gravity warping. Otherwise, why would they put it in a big cough drop, triangular shape, Massive vehicle that has no aerodynamic qualities at all. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I think that time frame that you mentioned as well, I mean, uh, I don't think we've spoken about this, but the um, Project Winterhaven, which was the Thomas Townsend Brown proposal, I think, which was mid-50s, I think, it's alleged that um, around about 1956, a lot of the anti-gravity research went black. And uh, they, in the white world, it was just all regarded as n- nonsense from that point forward. And uh, that, that's at that time, then, I think, at least to me at least, uh, you know, it ties in with the, the sort, of, sort of time scales you were just talking about. You're absolutely right. Like, what was amazing to me is that <clears throat> with the advent of the Internet, Google, uh, I started researching uh, basically gravity research. Uh, back after World War II and after, obviously after Roswell. And there was massive investments, numerous companies getting funded by the Department of Defense, uh, to work on gravity engineering or gravity, uh, nullification or gravity as a propulsive, uh, tool. And there were front page headlines all Every major city about gravity breakthroughs or anti-gravity vehicles in the near future. I mean, it was just, it it was, it was was way out in the open. And, you know, major countries were saying, well, we're near breakthroughs or we've just made some breakthroughs that are paying off. And then all of a sudden, like you said, about the mid fifties, uh, Convair, uh, gravity ran. All these corporations, and they just went totally silent on the issue. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, I think I think it's just symptomatic of what what was going on. You know, people pulling the strings behind the scenes, so to speak, to uh, allow them to uh, do their own research in secret. That, that's what it seemed like to me, and I think everything well, told I mean, if- ties up with that. If they had a breakthrough in the mid fifties, that's almost sixty years ago. It's, it's about fifty eight, fifty nine years ago. I mean, uh, it's just incredible. And then you've got uh, the Bell that used a mercury, uh, either plasma or fluid that the Germans were developing. It's right. one of the most top that's secret right. research right before the end of World War Two. And then you had all the paperclip scientists uh, and officers uh, that came over to the U.S. And obviously, I mean, it would seem to me like they continued doing the research and between having a one or two downed and recovered alien, air, alien 
saucers or whatever they were. Uh, and then you've got uh, all these German scientists that had getting ready to make breakthroughs in gravity. Uh, it's very possible that 90% of the UFOs we've seen since then might have been made on Earth. It, quite so. I, one thing I was going to add to the discussion there was um, I did have some communication with Nick Cook, the James Defence journalist. I don't know if you've, you ever had any contact with Nick Cook. I'm sure you've heard of him. Oh, way back he, in the day. Yeah. yeah. He'd, he'd, he wrote that book, The Hunt for Zero Point, which I think was published in uh, year 2000, I think. So it's, again, th getting on for 13, 14 years old now. And um, you know, basically... Uh, that, he said the same, but when I last heard of, from him, or when I last heard of him on the internet, he seemed to be going back on his original research, and he was claiming that the site that he'd been shown in, um, which used to be in Poland, or was in Germany for a while, the one that's where the, the, um, they had the underground uh, facilities in Germany, which was alleged to be where they were working on the belt, he, he, Nick Cook went back on that research, and he said, he didn't think that thing was for, for, for testing an anti-gravity propulsion system after all that. The fly trap, they called it, that circular structure that had uh, the pillars. You, you know, you're probably familiar right. with that story. He, he, he's now gone back yeah. on that. Uh, and the last I heard, he was kind of very, it's almost like he'd been warned off. And uh, he doesn't seem to have said much in the last uh, uh, six years, seven years or so. So I don't know if he's felt that it's become a bit too, too much of a, Hot area for well, he, he, can, he can take it all back, but it, 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 it's irrefutable that the, the Germans did have what they called the bell, and they were trying to use uh, develop exotic propulsion, and it did use uh, some form of mercury, whether, like I said, it was a fluid or a plasma, uh, and the, the fly trap it would have been a perfect setup uh, for testing. Uh, the vehicle above ground. So, I mean, people can take stuff back if, if it's no longer in favor to them personally or if they've got some agenda. But the fact remains is there's a lot of scientists that, uh, believe it's, it's what it's purported to be. And, and any thoughts for the future then? You know, what would, do you have any particular thoughts about, do you think that things are the same now as they were, you know, 10 years ago? Um, do you think more people are receptive to the sorts of things that you, you've been saying or less receptive or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on that, that sort of thing? Well, I, I talk about things like quasi crystals and metamaterials and, uh, certain fields of science that were unpopular or people like Daniel Sheckman uh, lost his job. He was a very respected physicist and he lost his job pursuing quasi-crystals and uh, he was very unpopular for a number of years and specifically when I was talking about quasi-crystals in the early 90s and came out and talked about them in 98, he was still very unpopular and then and, his, he was pretty much laughed at. So if if some people have said, well, I just looked it up in the literature, well, why would I pick a hypothesis that was extremely unpopular amongst fellow scientists, his peers, to promote? And then two years ago, he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry for quasi-crystals. So either I was psychic or... I knew what I was talking about.